department and she grows research tomatoes. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. How's everybody doing? My voice coming through? I'm gonna take, are you comfortable if I take my mask down? I'm gonna do that as well. Very good. So I did an internship in the campus garden in 2012 with Dr. Gloria Mouday um, and in conjunction with the Office of Sustainability, uh, Dee Dee DeLong Prey Johnston at the time was our Chief Sustainability Officer. She's now our VP of HR and Sustainability. Um, and I loved it. So I went to Central Carolina Community College and got a certificate in sustainable agriculture. I worked on a couple local farms, Fair Share Farm and Rail Fence Farm. You can visit them down at the Cobblestone Farmers Market on Saturdays. Um, and then I came back and Dee Dee and I kind of worked out a position. Uh, it was initially called the Campus as Lab Pilot Program. And the idea was to get students out of the classroom, applying what they were learning in class to sustainability issues on campus. So a lot of my work initially was in the campus garden, getting students who were learning about food and food systems out of the classroom into the garden to learn about sustainable agricultural techniques and other food system and food justice issues. Um, today that program's expanded quite a bit. We have students down here um, to explore Lake Catherine and the meadow and learn just generally about the systems on campus that sustain our lives. So our water, our energy and our food systems. Uh, this picture is a shot of the campus garden. There's gonna be two or three more here and I'll tell you more about the garden. Um, what I like to point out about this picture is that in our garden soils to keep them healthy and vibrant, right? Is we have something living, something dead, and something really, really dead all the time on our soils. Something living, something dead, something really, really dead. So today um, we're gonna talk about the importance of healthy ecosystems and healthy biological systems um, that keep us healthy as well as the garden healthy. Um, and so we'll touch on cover crops. We'll talk about the importance of mulching in a garden and the practice of applying compost. So something living, something dead, and something really, really dead. I have a question. Yeah. About pine needles. Yeah. Are pine needles uh, good for this soil? Or They're a fine addition. Oh, yep. Okay. Yep. No worries with pine needles. We primarily use wheat straw um, as a mulch just because of its versatility, but I'll get to that too in a minute here. I might be touching the wrong button. So the campus garden was started in um, 2008. And one of the things that we do now with uh, student groups is teach about climate change and sustainability. And so this is one of the things that I talk to students about all the time, just kind of the fundamentals of climate change. Um, so I apologize if this is redundant or repetitive, um, but we know that greenhouse gases right in the atmosphere trap heat. Um, our atmosphere is really, really thin. At, at its thick, thickest point, it might be about seven miles uh, deep, right? So the sun sends photons, right? Heat and light toward the earth. Right? The earth absorbs about two thirds of that solar energy. Another third is reflected back out into space. Um, that reflectivity of Earth's surfaces is called albedo, and it's really, really important. So as we see like white reflective sheets of ice melting, right, our, the Earth's albedo um, declines and we're not reflecting as much energy out into space. That's a little side note. Um, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, they have really wiggly bonds and they're able to capture solar energy, right? And keep it inside the Earth's atmosphere. Um, if we didn't have greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, right? The average temperature on Earth would be less than freezing, right? We would be a frozen ball of water if we did not have greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So we need them. But what we've seen over the last 800,000 years or so is that the Earth kind of fluctuates between 180 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 
And, you know, the earth fluctuates between having a little bit of carbon dioxide and a lot of carbon dioxide. The temperature of the earth um, correlates to that level of carbon dioxide. So as carbon dioxide levels go up to 280 parts per million, the globe experiences a warming trend. As carbon dioxide levels go down to 180 parts per million, the earth experiences ice ages. Right? Um, what we have seen in the last 200 years since industrialization and the use of fossil fuels to power our lives is that carbon dioxide levels today on a month to month average, right, have reached 419 parts per million. Right? So for 800,000 years, we've kind of gone like this, 180, 280, 180, 280. In the last 200 years, we've seen just a precipitous rise of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which is causing warming and um, just devastating ecological consequences, sea level rise, ice melt, more intense hurricanes, uh, et cetera. So this is what we do in the campus garden. Um, we teach about climate change and connect it to agriculture. So the most important carbon sequestration technology on the face of the earth, right? The most important technology that we have access to today for taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and storing it back in the ground, right? Are forests, forests and trees. Um, it is vitally important that we continue to preserve forests. Um, and as this relates to agriculture, that means we need to stop clearing forested area to grow commodity crops like soy and alfalfa hay, um, stop clearing forest to pasture um, cows, right? Um, preserve forest and intensify agriculture. About 80% of all the carbon, right, in the biosphere here uh, is stored in our soils, right? And that's really, really important. Um, the ground beneath our feet is a potential carbon sink. And so for the next you know, 20, 30 minutes or so here, um, if there are questions from our online audience, go ahead and put them in a chat and John will be your intermediary. He'll ask me uh, those questions. If y'all, the audience have any questions, please just speak up, we'll have a conversation. Um, we're gonna talk about ways to take carbon dioxide, right, which has been taken out of the atmosphere by trees and other plants and put that carbon in our soils to enrich and uh, make our soils more resilient and also promote you know, biological health of our soils. Right? We do that through mulching, composting, and cover cropping. Um, you can see here just a little bit about uh, the campus garden. We grow um, annual vegetable crops in six garden bed or six plots. Each one of our six plots in the campus garden is 40 feet by 40 feet. We have eight beds that are three feet wide. The aisles are two feet wide. So we say five foot on center. Um, I love those measurements Our 36 inch wide beds actually have a 30 inch bed top. And so a 40 foot long bed that's 30 inches wide is exactly 100 square feet. It makes math so easy when we're trying to calculate, you know, fertilizer application, how many seeds per foot, um, that kind of thing. And so I always advocate, you know, if you can do it, a 40 foot bed, 30 inches wide, um, with three inches of shoulder space on the side, gives you lots of room. The two foot wide aisle is really comfortable for all the volunteers that we have come through the garden. It's a system that's worked really well for us. So we have six plots, eight beds in each plot. That's uh, what, 48 beds total, um, where we're doing annual vegetable production around the perimeter of the garden. Let's see if we've got that. Around the perimeter of the garden, we've started experimenting um, with uh, perennial planting. So we have an entire bed of asparagus. We have several rain gardens for catching rainwater, uh, slowing that water down um, and allowing that to water to percolate into the soil. I'll talk more about that. Um, and then we also have the beginnings of a hedgerow that runs between two of our garden plots. Um, and that hedgerow um, 
is a mix of beneficial perennials that attract pollinators and provide habitat for predatory insects. I'll talk more about that too. So what you can see here is uh, the application of mulch. I already said I love using wheat straw in the garden. Um, so one of the challenges in North Carolina are our very wet springs, right? And so in order for us to be able to get into the soil and plant our early spring crops, um, I'll form our beds. I'll like build up our raised beds in the fall when the soil is like that nice, uh, when it's dry enough to work. Um, and we'll cover it with straw mulch for the entire winter. That's gonna cut down, it cuts down on erosion. It cuts down on compaction, you know, when a hard rain comes through and kind of pounds the soil, it creates a little crust on the soil. The straw helps diffuse that water. Um, it helps with water infiltration as it slows down those rains. Um, and it also provides habitat for some of our primary decomposers, things like um, pill bugs and spiders and worms, um, arthropods of all sorts, right? So it's providing habitat for other organisms. In the spring then, we don't have to till. We don't have to disturb the soil at all. I don't have to manage a cover crop, which I'll talk about in a minute. All the volunteers do is rake that straw into the aisle and we've got a nice clean bed top that's um, been enriched by biological activity throughout the winter and we can plant right into that. And then the added benefit is the straw, as you can see here, ends up in the aisle and our volunteers walk on it, right? And that um, prevents our early spring weeds from ger germinating. It deprives them of sunlight, right? It, it acts as a, a heavy mulch. Uh, you'll see in a minute our compost piles. We use a lot of wheat straw as well. Um, the other really cool thing in the fall, so this picture here is in the, in the fall. You can see like the August sun burning that poor young man's shoulders. Um, they're planting broccoli transplants. Um, we always mulch our brassica transplants in the fall because of those hot late summer days. Um, that mulch functions as an air conditioner. Um, so when classes come out to tour the garden in September uh, and it's a hot, you know, 85 degree day with intense afternoon sunshine, I'll invite the students to slip their hand underneath the straw mulch. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll remind them that snakes like this habitat too. Um, <laughs> Um, and worms and things like that. So I usually only have a few people that are really interested in doing this, but if you slip your hand under the straw, it's about 15 degrees cooler than the top of the straw. Um, it functions as an air conditioner. It helps preserve soil moisture so that we have to irrigate less frequently. Um, also, yeah. Someone asked a question. They said, whenever they've used wheat straw as a mulch, it's sprouting grass yeah, yes. Um, that's a thing that happens. Um, there are inevitably seeds in your wheat straw. Um, I'm really fortunate at the campus garden, we've got daily volunteer hours. Um, so we can have the volunteers pull those um, little sprouts. Um, typically in the fall, I'm not really worried about it because the, um, the, the broccoli plants will mature fast enough to like outcompete those. I, we'll just let them grow and then a frost will come and, and they'll kind of winter kill. Um, it, it's, it's one of the things to, to be mindful of. Um, and so I'll show you our compost piles. One of the ways that we deal with that is we let those seeds germinate um, when we're using the straw around the compost piles. And then, you know, and then we get clean straw that we can use, but I'll, I'll show you that too here in a second. Um, it's never been a significant issue before. So, um, and that's in part because I have lots of free skilled labor. Um, other notes, other notes. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and advance. Yeah, wood chips. So this is the other uh, resource that we have access to. The campus garden is really unique because I have the entire landscaping department to, to reach out to and say, hey, uh, Jim Muster, our campus to arborist, I need a truckload of wood chips and he'll bring it right out to the garden and we can let those wood chips sit for a couple months um, and they turn into fantastic mulch that we use in our walking aisles. So we're never using wood mulch in our growing beds. We don't want that carbon rich 
uh, wood debris um, to kind of tie up any carbon in the decomposition process, um, but it's fantastic in our aisles, and this is why. I don't know if everyone's going to be able to see this, but um, I brought some wood mulch in. This is from uh, one of the aisles in our third block, and I'll kind of pass this around. Take a handful first. John, I'm going to make a mess of your nice, clean education space. Excellent. Thanks, Forrest. If you all want to uh, pass that around or come take a look, there aren't too many of you all. So you can I'll play band on white. Run, you can like take your hands through there. Um, and what we're looking for, oh, here's a great example. So check out that wood chip. If you'd like to hold it, you may. What you'll see as you look through these wood chips is kind of white fibrous filament. Are you able to see that running through the wood chip? Um, inside of these, try to find a good example for our friends on camera. How's that? Can you all see that? Let's see. Yeah, there you go. See that the white filaments there? So uh, wood, wood chips are made of cellulose and lignin, right? Carbon forms that are uh, really uh, resistant to biological decomp or to bacterial decomposition, right? And so we pile them up in the aisles uh, and we allow fungal communities to um, start breaking down the cellulose and lignin. Um, fungi, saporific fungi, um, Saporific comes from the, the Greek uh, sapro for decay, uh, decomposition, decay, rot. Um, these saporific fung funguses that love decay, they secrete enzymes and acids that break down cellulose and lignin. And you can actually see their hyphae. These are, I don't know, sort of like root structures, this filamental hyphae that has. Um, um, taken up residence here inside of our wood chips. Uh, it's really cool. I hope you're able to see it. If not, come on out to the garden. We're at 1141 Polo Road. Visit anytime and check out the fungal hyphae in our wood chips. Um, having a row that we're not tilling, right? Having wood mulch where we're not tilling um, allows these fungal um, organisms to kind of take hold so that um, we practice reduced tillage in the garden. I'll till maybe once every three years or so, a very shallow tillage if it's necessary. But after the tiller goes through there and disturbs our soil um, and disrupts some of these fungal communities, I know that in the aisles, I have fungal communities already established that will kind of um, re-inoculate our beds. Um, so these fungal hyphae are really important. They're breaking down our wood chips. And as they break down, um, you can start to see some rich black compost-like humus um, underneath the mulch. I'll actually go through, and again, every two or three years, uh, we'll till those aisles where, where the wood mulch has accumulated. And it's like it's composted in place. And I'll have students rake that, uh, com those composted wood chips right on top of the bed. And so that's one way that we kind of build our permanent raised beds is every two or three years, we till up the aisles that have been heavily wood chipped and add that composted material to the beds. Is that hardwood? Uh, hard and soft. Both? Yep, whatever, uh, whatever Jim's cutting down, that's what I'm applying. Uh, we like to let it sit for a little while, um, but yeah, hard or soft. Hard is obviously gonna persist a little bit longer, but either way. Yeah, so wood mulches, really important. Straw mulch, really important. Compost is the other way that we take advantage of dead plant material to enrich our soil with carbon. Um, so here's our strategy for composting. Um, we have a relationship with Campus Kitchen, which is a student-led organization. Those students go around to local grocery stores and collect food that is at the end of its um, saleable life still good, still edible. Um, so they collect that food and they uh, bring it back to campus where they prepare it into meals to be distributed to a variety of social services agencies around town. The food um, that they cannot uh, use or redistribute, um, food waste from their cooking process, comes out to the campus garden where we compost it. 
Um, I like to build uh, bins made out of straw bales, wheat straw bales. So you can see I've used about 16 straw bales here to create a bin that is about two cubic yards in size. So if you're composting at home and you want to do it thermophilically, you want, if you want to get temperatures up into the 140, 150, 160 degree Fahrenheit range, you've got to have at least a cubic yard of material. Um, once you get to that cubic yard size or more, you have um, a sufficient volume of bacterial organisms to generate that kind of heat. It's, it's difficult to impossible below a cubic yard. Um, that said, you know, organic matter is going to decompose, you know, um, so if you've got one of those barrel rollers or whatever you're using, that's fine. Um, but we're really aiming for thermophilic compost. And as you can see here, after we built this pile, um, it got up to about 160 degrees Fahrenheit, which in truth is a little too hot. We probably need to water that pile or turn that pile to help bring it back down. Uh, 155 is kind of the roof, the ceiling that we're shooting for. But those high temperatures are important for, for um, destroying human pathogens that may be in that food waste. Um, it also um, destroys weed seeds. Um, the benefit here for us of doing it inside of a straw bale bin is that we don't have to turn it as frequently. Um, the straw bales act as insulators um, so that those really high temperatures go the whole way to the edge of the pile, not just right in the center. Um, typically to get temperatures that high, you've got to turn your compost pile by hand several times. It, to incorporate material at the edge of the pile into the middle of the pile where it gets really hot. Um, to ask student volunteers to turn two cubic yards of compost, you know, three or four times every two weeks, um, it's too much, right? It would be too much for me, it's too much for them. Um, so we insulate the pile so that we only have to turn our piles two to three times over the course of maybe four to six months while that compost is finishing. Um, we're using, in addition to nitrogen-rich food waste, we're using leaves from campus as a carbon source. Um, we're using this straw. So um, the thing about food waste is it comes in all the time. The thing about compost is the pile's got to rest. You can't add food waste it, to it perpetually. So the solution that we found was to set up three of these compost bins. We have one that you can actively add food waste to. We have one that is actively composting. Um, and we have one that is resting and preparing to go out into the field. Um, but the cool thing about that is these straw bales decompose as the composting process is happening. So when that compost is ready to go out into the field, the straw bales that were surrounding it are ready to go back into our active pile, right? So we're using that straw both as an insulator and as an ingredient for compost. Um, if we don't need it as an ingredient for compost, it's fantastic as a mulch, right? We'll take it out into the field and mulch it. Um, one of the tasks that I give to students often is moving stuff, right? <laughs> moving wood chips, moving straw. Um, straw is a really great resource that's terrific for the garden. Do y'all have any thoughts or questions about mulching and composting? I actually brought some compost too, if you wanted to check that out. Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I often get asked, oops, my apologies for that. There we go. Yeah, I'm often asked if our compost um, contributes fertility to the garden. It's, I really consider it because we're only using food waste and garden residues, um, so like old crops, um, I really consider it more of a soil conditioner, right? It's a source of organic matter. Um, and in a moment here, I'll talk about why uh, organic matter in the soil is so very, very important for your soil structure. Um, but no, I do not consider it a source of your micronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, if we were using animal manures, um, we do have chickens at the campus garden, so I'll occasionally include chicken bedding. Um, but like if we had access to sheep manure or llama manure or something like that, then I would consider it um, a nutrient source. There would be a little bit more nitrogen and phosphorus in that compost. 
Um, so compost is really, really cool. I call it my bacteria farm, right? It, here, I, I've got the garden where I'm growing vegetables. Here are my compost pile where I'm raising bacteria. There are trillions and trillions of bacterial life forms in this compost pile. And one of the coolest one is um, our actinomyces. Um, so actinomyces um, release this like um, the earthy smell that you get in a compost pile that comes from actinomyces. Um, if you'd like to smell the compost, you're welcome. Although I don't think anyone's, yeah, too willing to get their hands dirty, which is all right. Um, one of the things that I tell students about um, is um, there's research out of the University of Colorado um, about um, uh, Mycobacter baccae, um, vaca for cow, Latin for cow. They discovered this uh, bacteria in cow manure initially. Um, but when human beings get this bacteria up under their nails and you ingest it or somehow absorb it into your body, um, it releases serotonin in your brain, which is a natural kind of antidepressant, a pick me up, right? So there's bacteria in our compost and in our soils that have beneficial. Um, reactions, relationships with our bodies. I'll talk more about that when we talk about cancer, for instance. Another thing that we use is biochar. If y'all would like to see some biochar, here's my jar of char. Um, this is uh, Miles Silman's, Dr. Miles Silman's lab in the biology department. Dr. Silman um, participates in Sencia uh, down in the Madre, Madre de Dios region of Peru. Um, they are working with biochar to help um, heal soils, forest land that has been uh, stripped, cleared for gold mining, illegal gold mining operations. Um, you can learn more about that at Dr. Silman's website, but biochar is just organic matter that is burned right at a very high temperature, very, very efficient, efficiently. And so what you end up with is essentially a carbon skeleton, right? Um, I won't go into that too much where, where I like to use it, it's, it's pricey. And so we use it in our transplant production. Um, we'll use, you know, your standard potting mix with a little bit of biochar and vermicompost. Um, and then when we plant that into the soil, right, it's there, it's part of the soil. It's a way to add lots of um, carbon to your soils, which improves everything from nutrient holding capacity to water holding capacity. Um, yeah, Here's some biochar. So here's an example of cover cropping. A uh, cover crop is an annual crop that's grown at very tight spacing and isn't harvested. We're not gonna harvest it um, for a crop. What we're gonna do is let it mature and then we're going to terminate it. We're gonna kill it. We're gonna either crimp it or we're gonna weed whack it or um, flail mow it, right? And we're going to either turn it into the soil to add um, those nutrients into the soil or we're gonna take it off and compost it, right? And we'll return that compost to the soil. Cover cropping is a really, really important strategy for sequestering carbon from the atmosphere and getting that carbon down into your soils. Um, so you can see this is sun hemp. Um, it's at the flowering stage. So one of the challenges of managing a cover crop is killing it. <laughs> um, if you've you know, ever grown a cover crop like rye, for instance, um, if you don't uh, terminate it at the right time, it'll grow right back. Um, and so th this is right at that wonderful flowering stage where the plant has started to take energy from the roots, from the crown of the plant and put it into flower and seed production. And that's when the plant uh, senesces, that's when we want to go through and terminate it, right? Um, yeah, I could talk for a long time about cover crops. I brought one with me here. So one of the very coolest things about cover crops, in addition to the fact that they're taking carbon from the atmosphere and putting it in your soil, um, they are covering the soil with like a living mulch essentially um, and protecting it from erosion. Um, they're also, in this case, sun hemp and uh, legumes like this cow pea. Does anybody eat black eyed peas on a year's day? This is a cow pea. Here we go, 
Legumes like this cowpea and clover and vetch and the sun hemp, they form a symbiotic relationship with soil bacteria, uh, families rhizobia. And that rhizobia infects the root hairs of the plant. The plant forms a nodule around the bacteria and that bacteria feeds the plant nitrogen. Um, and so like if y'all were to take a deep breath, 78% of that breath is nitrogen, right? Two nitrogen molecules that are held together um, by a trivalent bond, two, two nitrogen atoms that are held together in a trivalent bond. They're super duper stable. Um, I think I've got a picture of this as a matter of fact. Okay. So what you can see here is that inside of our leaves, chlorophyll, right? The thing responsible for photosynthesis and feeding plants has nitrogen at its very heart. Nitrogen is the most important plant nutrient for green leafy growth, right? Without nitrogen, your plants are stunted and weak. The atmosphere is filled with nitrogen. We swim in nitrogen all the time, but that nitrogen is very, very stable and the plant can't digest it right, in its atmospheric form. And so what the plant needs is a partner, and that partner is rhizobia bacteria. A bacteria inside of these nodules is able to break apart atmospheric nitrogen into a soluble form that the plant can consume, and the plant in return, right, gives uh, that bacteria sugars, carbohydrates, right, dextrose. I like to say that the plants bring cupcakes to the party. They're the most popular organism in the world because they bring the cupcakes. They make the sugar. Um, I'll give one of these nodules to y'all, if you don't mind. Thank you. All right, and now what I'm going to ask you to do, uh, ready? They're just going to fall into your hand there. So if you, have you seen this demonstration? All right. Um, if you will take, and I'll, this is the camera, if I get real close up, if you take these nodules and you squeeze them in your fingers, what you may be able to see is... What do you see coming out of that nodule if you squeeze it and smoosh it? Moisture. Yeah, yep. Yeah, there's a liquid in there. What color do you, is it? Clear. A little bit clear. Mm -hmm. Are you finding any color in yours? Black, a little black. Uh, there you go. Okay. Yeah, so see some little dots. Let me here, watch between my fingers there. Did you see the color? Okay. It's a little pink, it's pink. Uh, if you squeeze the nodule until it ruptures, phew, little pink juice will come out of it. Yes, we got folks seeing it now, excellent. Is that the sugar? No, that is leg hemoglobin. It's akin to the hemoglobin in your blood that binds to oxygen and transports oxygen around your body. Leg hemoglobin inside that nodule is binding to oxygen so that the bacteria can do the chemical work necessary to break apart atmospheric nitrogen and feed it to the plant. The really cool thing that I just wanted to say, um, one of the most important things that we can do to reduce our carbon impact, to reduce our climate impact is to eat less beef. Um, cows are, cow, cows contribute, or cows are our greatest source of methane emissions, methane being about 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Um, raising cows the way that we do is incredibly ecologically destructive. Um, and so food scientists have been working on finding beef substitutes. Um, so the impossible burger, if anybody has an impossible burger, this is a story about the impossible burger. Um, the Impossible Burger is a plant-based burger that has a bloody red texture, kind of like a juicy, bloody, irony, meat-like flavor. Food scientists found a way to take leg hemoglobin, right, from the, these plant nodules, and they took the gene for producing leg hemoglobin and inserted it into a strain of yeast. And the yeast is able to produce massive quantities of leg hemoglobin that what gives the juice that pink color, right? And put that, use that leg hemoglobin as an ingredient in the pos impossible burger, right? Leg hemoglobin akin to hemoglobin, that bloody rich irony taste. Um, that's a little side note, but. Is, is nitrogen 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So nitro atmospheric nitrogen, right, has this really stable trivalent bond. And so we know that bacteria are capable of breaking apart that nitrogen. The other thing that's able to do it are lightning strikes. So the question was, can lightning, I've heard that lightning can break apart atmospheric nitrogen. And that's exactly right. That's the kind of power that's necessary to break apart that, that trivalent bond that nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen has. Um, yeah, if you're interested, it's called the Haber-Bosch process. Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch were German physicists around the turn of the 20th century, um, and they figured out how to take atmospheric nitrogen, put it under intense heat and pressure at a catalyst, and effectively rip that nitrogen apart and turn it into liquid ammonia. Um, which is kind of the foundation of our liquid fertilizers and also explosives. Um, it's a fascinating story. Um, the Haber-Bosch process, they won a Nobel Prize for their discovery. Um, today, it's estimated that 50% of the calories available to us come from synthetic nitrogen that's been derived from the Haber-Bosch process. Um, the thing that makes that unsustainable is that it requires methane. It requires natural gas, which, you know, a fossil fuel, both as an ingredient in the process and also as fuel for what is an energy intensive process. Remember, it's like the equivalent of a lightning strike. It's very, very energy intensive. And so using this biological relationship is really, really important. When you buy USDA certified organic produce, it's likely that the farmer used a cover crop and took advantage of this biological relationship to increase the nitrogen levels in their soil. Going back to bees, they, in Bloomberg this week, we have an article about a certain kind of cow where they were taking the cells, cells out and turning them uh, into steaks and hamburgers. Yeah, lab meat. Yeah, yeah, food scientists are really working on finding ways to uh, more sustainably. Yeah, yeah. I mean, raising cattle uh, in the United States the way that we do it is ecologically destructive and um, a significant contributor to greenhouse gases. And so I'm open to most innovations, but that's a different conversation entirely. Okay. Yeah, I'm just curious about yeah, here's an example of two other types of cover crops. Um, this one here is uh, vetch and rye. The rye grass grows tall, sequesters a lot of carbon. Uh, the vetch is a legume, so it forms that nitrogen fixing relationship. Uh, this is clover, and you can see our little pollinator there. Um, and I'll talk about our bees in a minute. Um, a healthy garden, right, has a vibrant, um, community of biological organisms. We, um, and so what we do in the campus garden is try to create um, little ecosystems for things like pollinators. This is our certified Monarch Way Station. This was a student project. Um, it started as a waterlogged area next to one of our garden plots. Um, we were losing a, a fair amount of soil here from the garden due to stormwater and rain. And so a group went ahead and we dug a pit and we created a level berm around that pit. We filled that pit with compost, right? And now when it rains, water fills that rain garden area. Um, and we planted plants, which we got from Hayden and the team here at Renolda Nursery. Um, we planted plants that like wet feet, right? They can tolerate moisture in their root zone. Um, so things like uh, milkweed, and uh, this is, I think, bergamot over here. And this one in the back is called cup flower. If you can snag a plant, um, it's prolific. It readily reseeds. It gets to eight to 10 feet tall. Uh, John, you'll not be surprised that it's a yellow compound flower. Um, yep, damion composite, right. Um, it's called cup flower is the common name. I don't know the scientific name. Hold on here. John's going to say it into the mic. Silphium perfoliatum. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, cup flower is really cool because the leaf forms a cup where it uh, connects to the stem of the plant. And so in the summer, when it's dry, I'll take the hose over to the garden in the morning 
and water the cup flower, just let water rain down on it and we'll fill those little cups. And in the afternoon, three or four o'clock, you can go out there and you can hear the bees. Like it's just a cacophony of buzzing. You can stand there and just listen to the life that is trying to find that water. Um, it's fantastic, right? And so we're growing lots and lots of perennials in the campus garden to provide habitat for our pollinators, for our butterflies. Also for our predatory insects. If you're not familiar with uh, the tachnid wasp, the predatory wasps, um, they will seek out tomato hornworms. This hornworm is about the size of your thumb. Um, they can defoliate a tomato plant overnight. If you go out and you notice that the leaves on your tomato plant are disappearing kind of from the top down, really take your time, get in there and look for one of these guys. Um, if you see one with these little cocoons, like the, um, I guess they're not cocoons because they're not butterflies. It's a, uh, well, what happens? The wasp finds the caterpillar injects its eggs into the caterpillar. The eggs hatch, the larvae devour the inside of the caterpillar and they pupate on the outside of the caterpillar. So if you see one of these gar in your garden, leave it alone. Their little baby uh, parasitic wasps are about to hatch. Um, and that's a huge win. Uh, these are ladybugs in, uh, involved in a public display of affection. Uh, ladybugs are fantastic for aphid control. At the campus garden, we don't use any synthetic or organic pesticides. Um, and that's in large part because we've uh, developed habitat for our beneficial organisms. Beneath the soil, the same kind of thing is happening. John, how am I doing on time? What time of day is it? Wrapping it up. I get so excited. Sorry about this, y'all. Um, growing cover crops. This is uh, called the rhizosphere, the root zone of a plant. Plants are secreting root enzymes all the time. A plant will share between like five and 30% of the carbohydrates that it makes through photosynthesis with organisms in the root zone. Um, root exudates include not only carbohydrates, but amino acids and um, phytochemicals, things like anthocyanin, um, that when we ingest it, reduce inflammation in the body and help ward off different kinds of cancers. Uh, tobacco, for instance, um, in, its, in a tobacco root exudates, there are about 2,500 different types of phytochemicals, right? And so plants are constantly interacting and dependent upon the organisms down here in the root zone, in the rhizosphere. This is one of my favorite Wendell Berry quotes, right? He's emphasizing that our health as individuals, right? Um, well, it's not as important as the health of our communities, right? The smallest unit of health are our communities. So the bees are a wonderful example of that. There can be up to 40,000 bees or more in a single hive. To think of them each as individuals um, is not helpful, right? From the moment a baby bee comes out of the comb, right? It has a very specific job to do to kind of perpetuate the life and health of that colony. These bees function together as a single unit, as like a single organism. Um, the same is true with plants and the rhizosphere and in our own bodies as well, right? Our guts are filled with back beneficial bacteria. For every one bacterial pathogen in the world, there are about 700 non-pathogenic bacteria. Um, in our bodies, right? For every single human cell in our body, there are about three bacterial cells. Right? We are a living trellis for beneficial bacteria and other microbes. Um, skip that. This is like diversity, right? It's key to human health. Um, yeah, I just don't have time to go into all this. John, you'll have to have me back in the spring. I can talk more about the health benefits here of all the things that we grow in the garden. So here's Dr. Gloria Moudet. Uh, Dr. Moudet is showing off her research tomatoes. These are heirlooms that produce an anti-inflammatory 
flavanol called anthocyanin. So anytime you see red or purple in a crop, except for beets, beets are the except, exception, but red Russian kale, um, this is ruby streaks mustard and Cherokee blue mustard, right? Y'all can see the purple color in these crops. Uh, our purple kohlrabi, right? Our red chard, right? This is a pigment called anthocyanin. It's an anti-inflammatory. So when it is ingested, it reduces inflammation in the body and helps prevent a number of cancers. So Dr. Muday here is showing us her heirloom tomatoes that produce anthocyanin. What Dr. Muday is researching um, is how anthocyanin makes a more resilient tomato. Um, anthocyanin, so in times of heat and drought stress, right, we all know that the climbing, climate is warming and that we're experiencing prolonged periods of uh, drought and heat stress. When a tomato plant experiences heat stress, it produces um, ROS, um, reactive oxygen species. ROS, right? Those ROS within the plant are kind of like petulant little kids, like toddlers throwing a tantrum. Um, inside like the leaf of a plant, for, for instance, um, those ROS will slam shut the stomata of a, of a leaf. So on the underside of a leaf, right, there are pores uh, that allow carbon dioxide to come in, which is used for uh, photosynthesis. Um, ROS will slam those shut, slow down photosynthesis, um, and that has the benefit, right, of reducing transpiration, right? So the ROS is reducing the amount of water that the plant is losing. Unfortunately, those um, ROS persist in the plant for a number of days, right? And if, if ROS persist in a plant for too long, they'll actually prevent photosynthesis from happening, right? And they'll stunt the plant. It can, come be, it can become harmful to the plant, right? And so what Dr. Muday is discovering is that plants that produce more anthocyanin, more of this powerful, potent purple plant pigment, um, that, that, that antioxidant, right? That flavanol anthocyanin um, is kind of like a parent that calms the petulant child down, right? That uh, kind of rubs its back and helps redirect it. Um, so anthocyanin is really, really important to um, balancing, right? This uh, reactive response that the plant has to heat stress. Some of the other benefits to anthocyanin, um, you can see here on the top of the tomato where the sun is hitting the tomato, anthocyanin is produced as a kind of sunscreen for tomatoes. Um, pollen is perhaps the most important thing. So ROS um, goes around and destroys pollen. It, it makes the pollen grains explode, right? Which is a, a you know, it could be a good reaction. If you're a, a tomato plant under heat stress, um, you don't want to be producing tomatoes. Um, and so ROS goes around and um, uh, destroys pollen grains. Anthocyanin reduces the amount of ROS in the plant and maintains po pollen viability for longer periods of time during periods of uh, heat stress, right? And so Dr. Muday is trying to grow a tomato with more anthocyanin, more purple um, that can stand up to prolonged heat stress. Uh, it's really important for our bodies too, because when we ingest anthocyanin, it helps reduce inflammation in our bodies. It feeds those good gut microbes that help um, reduce inflammation and prevent cancers in our own body. So I like to say that Dr. Muday is researching how to grow a cancer-fighting ketchup, right? A tomato richer in anthocyanin so that we can produce a cancer-fighting ketchup so that my seven-year-old will actually eat a tomato uh, and get the benefits. And this is just an example of all the different purple produce that we grow in the campus garden. I'm really committed to this idea of growing more purple produce, of um, having a more colorful diet. Um, it has all kinds of health benefits, which I'll talk about in the spring, perhaps. Do y'all have any questions or thoughts? Uh, I was wondering, in today's situation of improving, we always see where that... No, it's really not. Our honeybees, uh, it's becoming increasingly difficult to be a keeper beekeeper in our part of North Carolina. Um, 
there are all kinds of environmental stressors. So the loss of habitat um, in a warmer climate, I mean, uh, for us, it means a more humid climate and humidity fosters a lot of fungal diseases. There are varroa mites, um, just a number of stressors, um, uh, pesticide use, all kinds of things stressing out our bees and making it really difficult to keep bees in the Carolinas. Yes, scale is really important here. Um, Yep, scale is really, really important as we're, you know, the things that I'm demonstrating in the campus garden, the things that I'm doing at my own house, you know, um, reducing my own carbon footprint. Um, at the end of the day, it's not really going to have the kind of impact that we need. We meet, need to make these kind of changes on a cultural level, on a nation state level. Um, there are folks meeting uh, right now, right, um, to try to make those changes that we need. But um, yeah, yep. The bees are, in spite of, you know, the perennials that we're planting, right, the bees are still struggling. They've got a lot of ecological stresses, environmental stresses to face. The purple warning, all the purple sweet potatoes and that's a totally different. No, yeah, purple sweet potatoes, anthocyanin, uh, purple tomatoes, purple green beans, um, that purple and blue color, blueberries, it's anthocy anthocyanin, purple carrots. Yep, pur purple carrots, anthocyanin. It's really, um, yeah, uh, when we ingest those kind of plant-based phytochemicals, um, it's really, really beneficial to our health. You know, you have that children behavior, uh, you being showing the antibacterial that that can be a problem. Yeah, and I don't, uh, I did bring it in, very good. Um, great book, um, I would recommend it, The Hidden Half of Nature. Um, Dr. David Montgomery and, and um, Bill K. She, uh, Anne, uh, was diagnosed with a cervical cancerous tumor. Um, she's a gardener, he's a geologist. Um, and so they wrote this fantastic book, really fascinating book about um, the microbiome, uh, the, the, the bacteria and things living in our gut that promote health and prevent cancer, um, cancerous inflammation. Um, and they also make, they go really deep into uh, the rhizosphere and bacteria in the soil and how to create healthy kind of biologically rich soils. Um, they kind of make the metaphor um, that um, eating fiber rich fruits and vegetables is like mulching your garden. <laughs> so the same way that adding mulch, carbon rich material to your garden benefits biological activity, eating more fibrous fruits and vegetables like is like mulching your gut. It really benefits microbial activity. So great book, I recommend it. Thank you, Nathan. And, and you had asked about bees. We actually in spring will have David Lynx, our beekeeper. Um, he's gonna give a presentation on bees. So a little hint of things now to come. Here. Mm -hmm. That'll oh. be here. Okay. Um, but David Lynx has the beehives up by Coliseum that are all multicolored. Um, there's about four hives, they're huge. Yep. Um, but you know we're we're already deep, deep you know knee deep in planning for spring, um, and as we are nearing the tail end of our talks for this this season. Um, next week we've got uh, uh, Hayden, our greenhouse manager, will be talking about bonsai. Then uh, I'll do a tree uh, a talk on trees called Timex trees. Uh, the old saying about takes a licking keeps on ticking. Oh, nice. uh, <laughs> and then the, the last talk of the season will be kind of a focus on what we've done in the gardens and what's coming up ahead, because believe it or not, we've got a lot getting ready to get started um, project wise. So we're, we're really excited about what's going on here. You know, thankful to have Nathan as a partner, um, not just, you know, in, in this talk, but also connecting us with students and classes uh, on the university of coming out here. Uh, it is a valuable resource. Um, and you know the whole campus is a lab is a fantastic idea, uh, but yeah, we might uh, I might yeah. take you up on that offer. I, I'm still I'm trying to fill out the schedule. So yeah, I'm around. I'd love to have you back. <laughs> I hope I'm not going anywhere. Oh yeah, but um, you know, thank everyone for uh, your attention, both in person and online, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. There you go. Thank y'all. Yeah. If y'all want to come and see this stuff, it's really cool. It's, uh,